The Britain of 50 years ago was a very different place. In 1948, the nation was still counting the cost of victory in World War II. It was a country about to lose an empire, and it was a country that was almost exclusively white. But Britain was about to face the biggest wave of non-white immigration in its history, a wave that would bring half a million people from the West Indies. This is their story, the hopes they brought, the reality they found. You would see sign put up rooms for rent, no niggers need apply. You felt that you were an intruder, and truly, you were a foreigner. It is the story of those who resisted change. Just feel, especially in everyday life, you know, as the English population thought, my God, we have a black population that is going to stay. Immigration! No! Repatriation! Yes! Our story begins exactly 50 years ago with the historic voyage of 500 West Indians on the Empire Windrush. June 21st, 1948. Although the Windrush had come 5,000 miles to Britain, to most on board it seemed like a homecoming. Back in the colonial Caribbean they had left, everyone was steeped in a way of life that was entirely British. We were brought up that we are British, and we were brought up that England is your mother country, and we were brought up to respect the royal family. So no way you, any of us would ever dare to go and speak anything against the royal family. When World War II broke out in 1939, it seemed entirely natural that 10,000 West Indians would volunteer for the war effort. This squadron, Jamaica Squadron, was named after the island that paid for the planes. But it was in manpower rather than money that the Caribbean made its biggest contribution. I was sitting in college at the time, and I remember these white men came from England, and they took these, what we call trucks, you know, open trucks, and they went to all the country past, the little nooks and crannies, and they begged people to come and fight for your motherland, come and fight for England. Those days. I went to England in 1940 to join the Royal Air Force. Why? Well, you know, it, it, Jamaica was a colony then, and um, I suppose all loyal colonials, young men anyway, would feel you had a duty. Plus, I had a copy of Mein Kampf and was drowsing through it. I came across a passage where Hitler described black people and Jews as semi-developed, anthropoidal, that sort of thing. Very derogative terms. And as a young man, he said, to hell with you. If that's the way you think, I'm going to fight this war. I'm going to join the Air Force. I'm going to shoot your tail off and come back home. West Indians and Britons not only lived together, they also died together. Of the 250 of us who came from Trinidad alone, 52 were killed. One of them um, was in class with me at school, uh, but we ended up on the same squadron. We were doing low-level daylights at the time. And he was killed on the seventh operation. But with Hitler defeated, British attitudes to the West Indians changed abruptly. I was on a bus, and there were two service people in front of me, one a woman. And she was saying, isn't it about time they went back to their homes? And it was the first time that it hit me that, you know, that people were putting up with us. But they didn't really want us, but we were a necessary evil sort of thing. 1947, 250 young RAF men went home on leave to the Caribbean, planning to return to England after a few weeks. Few realized the historic impact their example would have. One of the returning servicemen was Airman Newton Christian. I was supposed to be there for two months. They couldn't find me a ship to come back, so I stayed six months. 
So this um, Empire Windrush, I, I was told it was a, a captured German trooper. They send it to Jamaica to collect all the West Indians who weren't leave then to take us back. The Empire Windrush had been diverted from its normal route between Britain and Mexico. It had room for almost a thousand passengers. The ship's owners wanted to fill up the remaining spaces, so they offered a special one-way fare of 28 pounds, 10 shillings. There was no shortage of takers. Very few people would work and get rid of. Economic conditions in the Caribbean were harsh. The sugar fields had always been the region's main employer, but a hurricane in 1944 had laid waste to the island's crops. It was not the first time this had happened, but in the past, men had been able to find seasonal work in America. Now, new immigration laws had closed the doors to the United States. When I went back to Jamaica, it was shocking. Men who had been home guards, men who were working in the American factories and the farm, men who were on the Panama Canal, and all of us, I would say 30,000 men were thrown back without any planning. And I decided that my children would not grow up in a colony. So I came back on the SS Empire Windrush. It was from this harbor in Kingston, Jamaica, that the Empire Windrush set sail on its pioneering voyage. It was the 24th of May, 1948. For some, it was a voyage into uncertainty. But the ship's mood was boisterous. Most of the passengers were young men hoping for adventure. Even as the boat crossed the Atlantic, the first warnings were being sounded in England. MPs, led by Manchester's William Griffiths, called on the Minister of Labour to act. Order! Order! Will he do everything possible to dissuade the irresponsible people who are sending shiploads of West Indians to this country without there being any jobs here waiting for them? Yeah. The government response was clear. Commonwealth citizens could not be turned away. Four weeks after leaving Kingston, the voyagers caught their first glimpse of their new home. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans, citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Their spokesman sings his thanks to Britain. Now, may I ask you your name? Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Now, I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers. Is that right? Yes. I get this kind of wonderful feeling that I'm going to land on the mother country, the soil of the mother country. And I started composing the song, London is the place for me. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You, you can, can go, go to, to France, France or America, America, India, Asia, or Africa, but you must come back to London City. Most of the new arrivals had nowhere to live and no jobs to go to. While they looked for work, the government housed them in an old air raid shelter underneath Clapham Common in South London. I did not know how many people quite a few. I paid two shillings a night for it. And that was cheap. But um, as soon as you got work, you had to leave. I myself, I was only down there just over a week. Most of them didn't stay long at all. The first stop for most of the men in the shelter was the nearest labour exchange, Brixton. But none of the new arrivals had difficulty finding work. 
After suffering more than half a million casualties in the war, Britain was desperate for labor. The migrants simply settled where the jobs were, London, Manchester, the West Midlands. I can remember the Windrush people arriving at Wolverhampton High Level Station and whole long streams of young West Indians looking totally bewildered, clutching a bag with a few possessions and usually a piece of paper with the name of a firm that would employ them and, and a house to go to, coming streaming out of the station, not knowing what to do, not knowing what to do. And that, that was, I mean, that was the beginning. <laughs> How on earth people got the money to come here from places like West Africa and, and uh, Barbados and so I have no idea. They never seemed to earn anything when they were there and, and uh, most of them I think didn't make much effort to earn anything much when they were here either. Some of the people, when we arrive in British soil and people see chimneys and the houses, they thought they were factories. You know, some oh boy, plenty of work at this place. Seeing the chimneys and the houses, not knowing that that was for warmth, you know, in the house. The men settled into work quickly, but the English seemed bemused by them. First of all, it was a subject of curiosity. Uh, you, you know, which is quite surprising, because when you think that uh, you'd had black soldiers in, in England and, you know, people come up and rub your skin and see if it would come, rub off the black and rub your hair, and, you know, it's pretty insulting. As the Windrush migrants began to establish themselves, the then conservative government began to see a solution to its most acute problem, the shortage of labour in the public services, such as transport. The recruitment drive even took officials to the Caribbean. This campaign triggered a second wave of immigration far larger than the first. During the 1950s, nearly a quarter of a million West Indians arrived in England. I expected England to be this wonderful place, really wonderful, with large houses and um, certainly parties, the sorts of things you read in books, like, you know, don't forget that most of our reading was Jane Eyre. But the England they came to was an altogether different country from the one they'd read about. Our relationship had been a very intimate relationship, but with a kind of colonial dream of what England was. England at 4,000 miles removed. Only later, when you started to encounter people, especially, of course, working people, because I'd never met, you know, ordinary working English people before. I'd met English schoolmasters and English middle-class people and colonial civil servants and tourists and business people. But then... I was blown, I can tell you. I, I was shocked. I couldn't believe what I saw. You know, I, we arrived in Paddington and it was all very grey and dismal. You'd always had the sense um, in, in, the, in the colonies that England was much more prosperous and, and better looking than it was. I didn't expect it to be so shabby. I didn't expect it to feel so poor. The air was smoky and the sky was yellow. It was very much an alien, strange, cold landscape. One friend wrote until he is walking on a diamond pavement. But shabby post-war England held an even bigger shock in store. The indifference and antagonism of the people. When I came, I saw everybody going into their little our houses and then nobody spoke to you that never happened in Jamaica as long as you met somebody in the street whether you met them or not it's good morning good evening and hello 
and you find you'd be saying to somebody good morning and good evening and they never answered you. And then you felt stupid after that, so you stopped saying good morning and good evening. I had, as far as some people were concerned, a lot of unpleasant habits. In Jamaica, this is the normal way to attract the attention of the man behind the bar. In English pubs, they don't approve of it. A noise, of course. I mean, <laughs> their uh, music tastes weren't necessarily those of the normal local people. Uh, and um, gradually resentment began to build up. As their neighbours' coldness gradually turned to hostility, a menacing new slogan appeared, Keep Britain White. I can remember going for a dishwashing job. The wife shouted to her husband upstairs, Hi, John, you don't want in the dark his work in here, do you? you know, I walked off to that place with tears in my eyes, and if I could have got on a plane or a ship or anything that day, I would have left England. A lot of them would talk behind your back, the darkies, you know, you weren't a person, you were a darkie. And I was nursing at General Hospital. I was giving teas out. And this man said to the other man in the bed, don't trust these darkies, you know, they'll steal the milk, up, the milk out your coffee. That hurt. And the people who would come into the corner shop and they would be served before me, you know. And I would stand there, of course, to reserve to say anything about it. I remember that one blonde woman with a basket in her hand, she said, these niggers are everywhere, everywhere. I mean, you can't get rid of them everywhere. We went through them with the war and we went through them, you know, we, we, we have them here, everywhere. Still the numbers grew, and just as surely, so did the hostility. I lived quite near to Paddington, and you know, week after week at the end of the summer, you'd see people pouring off the trains, you know, in very substantial numbers. And I think the shock of people, you know, ordinary English people who'd never had any direct, much direct experience of the colonies and so on, unless they'd been placed out there during the war, suddenly to think, these are, this is my next door neighbor. This is the guy who's at the labor exchange coming for my job, you know. He's going to be driving my bus. That is a, you know, it's, it's a huge impact. You can just feel, especially in everyday life, you know, as the English population thought, my God, we have a black population that is going to stay. There's lots of talk about discrimination and all sorts of allegations that because coloured workers have different coloured skins that British people don't like them. That isn't a reason at all. There are good, realistic reasons why objections have been raised. First of all, the ones of personal habits. Some of them wash with oil. Oil with a strong smell. It can be very unpleasant if you're working close to them. That's something that the average British worker doesn't like. From the immigrants' point of view, white attitudes seem bewildering, even ungrateful. It was not explained why the West Indies were here. It was, in fact, because the British government wanted them here, because they were necessary to the economy. That was never really explained. You didn't have to explain that during the war, because we were in uniform. People could see why we were here, by the, the uniform we wore. See? What the new arrivals felt was a growing sense of isolation. You, you, you felt surrounded all the time. In those days, in those years, you felt that you were an intruder, and truly, you were a foreigner, you know. You were, you were, you were an outsider, you did not belong. I wish I could be back home so bad it hurts. Tears came into your eyes, because you miss the sort of freedom and companionship that you used to have. One day I was on a bus and I saw a black man and I just felt if only this bus would stop, I would get off it and just run and hug him 
and find out, you know, where he came from, because you feel lost, you know? Growing up, I could go for days and not see another black person. And as for white friends, I mean, I couldn't really say I had white friends, because um, no one ever invited me into their home, you know, never. So basically, um, in a sense, I was friendless. The young West Indians soon found solace in their own clubs, with their own music and their own celebrities. This wave of migrants was still overwhelmingly young and male. Most people were not ready for what followed. Romance across the color line. A lot of the black men who did come over were single men, unmarried, and they would come over as single men, and naturally, you know, they would be seen dancing with white girls or picking up white girls, going out with them, uh, and this aroused hostility among some of the white men. Uh, and then there's talk about, uh, I, wouldn't like, I wouldn't let my sister go out with one of them. You know, no decent girl would go out with a black man. This kind of talk. We used to come back to La Seam nearly every weekend and we used to meet up and things was going fine. We was courting and everything, you know, <clears throat> until my family found out. My family hit the roof. They hit the roof. So it was like one big argument I left and I knew what time Lloyd used to come from work so I met him at Euston Station he didn't know I was going to be there with me case so he said what's happened I said well family oh you know got to know that I'm going out with you and they've told me I must get out and blah blah and here I am I said to her, I said, well, I mean, come, we're going to fight it, you know, like that. And we go around and uh, we get, I did find a room, I did find a little room. And we was in that little room until we find a flat. White people would never speak to you. As they used to pass you, they used to spit. It was terrible. <laughs> Married now 47 years. Oh. And... We're still together, yeah. thank God. By the mid-1950s, West Indian immigration was rising to a peak. Over 20,000 a year were making the trip across the Atlantic. There was still plenty of work in rebuilding houses for those who had lost their homes to German bombs. But while the West Indians might be finding employment easily, it was to be housing that would provide the biggest test and the sharpest conflict. It was shocking. Uh, the accommodation. You go along some part in Nottingham, you would see sign put up rooms for rent, no niggers need apply. Rooms for rent, no one again, you see no Irish or niggers. That's not unusual. And that is the sort of conditions that uh, existed. A landmark BBC documentary followed one West Indian, Ben Bousquet, on a fruitless quest for accommodation. I was a young boy, and I was looking for lodgings and um, around the Brixton area. And it was incredible because um, the BBC um, followed me around. I've got rooms going. I I've got a room at home. Sorry, I can't let you in. Beg your pardon? I can't let you in. Um, I've got uh, 14 English boys in here. 14 English yeah. boys? Say, so don't want um, I can't, I can't mix. I'm ever so sorry. I wouldn't sell, but if I let you come in, all my boys would leave. If you let me come in. If I let you come in, all the other ones would go. Yes. Okay, I'm um, so sorry. Yeah, sorry. People made it sort of <laughs> silly excuses. I wouldn't have you because um, my husband wouldn't like it. I just, I know I don't take blacks um, and, and things like that. This was awful. It is an awful experience. 
I think that film was um, important in as much as it drew it. It was the first thing done on British television on race and the, and the, and the plight of black people. And it was important um, in as much as a lot of white people hadn't believed this until they saw it. It was not because you couldn't afford it, but because you were black, because of your color, that they would not be able to let you stay this awful. Yeah, that hurt. Yeah. That hurt a lot. Mm. Yeah, it still hurts even now. The new arrivals were forced into overcrowded, unsafe properties, which most whites would reject. In London's Notting Hill, Peter Rackman's slum dwellings quickly became a byword for the housing problem facing West Indians. I used a pair for a space in a room. There were three of us living in a room at the time, and we paid a guinea each, 21 shillings in those days. We knew we were being charged an awful lot, but you had to pit that against walking the streets. While Rackman was bad, he was the only person that would provide housing for us. Having left the West Indies, where you more or less have your own house and you have a back garden where you can have vegetables. When I came, I found me, my husband, and this baby in one room. I couldn't believe it. And I said to him, is this how, is this how I'm expected to live? But the appalling living conditions weren't the worst of Rachmanism. Rackman and his middlemen were also terrorizers. So that if you didn't pay your rent for a week or two, um, um, nobody would socially come around and ask you what was the problem if you were sick or whatever. You know, you didn't pay your rent out. It was not unusual to go off to work and come back and find out you're your household belonging was in the street. You know, you know, it might be um, just maybe a deal behind of your rent, or some people got beaten, beaten up. And it was that type of cruelty, you know, that was going on. Because we didn't have anybody to turn to. We had nobody to turn to. We kept our heads down, and we were fearful that if you created too much of a song and dance, you wouldn't have anywhere to live. The only way to escape the clutches of the slum landlords was to buy your own home. But the sight of black homeowners in Britain provoked yet more resentment. How would you like it if a house next door to you was taken by a colored person and became filled to bursting point with all his relations and his friends and so on and so forth? If you buy in an area, sometimes you could be there. People won't speak to you, you know. And um, it was openly said, black, white people would openly say, I don't know where they get the money from to buy houses, you know, of the come here. We've been here all this while and we can't buy a house and they've come and started buying houses. The growing number of black homeowners fueled speculation that West Indians were raising the money for houses from prostitution and racketeering. In fact, they had brought a far less exotic method with them from the Caribbean. People from the Caribbean were bringing with them certain things. The, the first thing that I'm conscious of is, is the system that people call susu, partner, or box, um, which, which means that you get a circle of friends and they all put a certain amount of money in every week, and every week somebody gets a lump sum that, that's made up of all the money that each one puts in. And that enabled people to buy houses and um, or give them the deposit for houses. They accumulated sums of money and they bought property. And that caused an impasse, that caused a problem, because people were wondering how they were getting this money to buy these property. And so the label of um, running prostitutes on the streets 
selling dope and all of that sort of thing arose. Resentment against West Indians was now reaching its boiling point. Racial hostility was increasingly accompanied by violence. I used to carry a piece of steel, a uh, steel bar, you know, in my sleeve because you never know. I mean, you know, I mean, if you saw three or four white guys moving towards you, man, I mean, you had to be, you had to be sharp because you never know what they're gonna do. Tell the boys, whenever time they see a black person on the street, they'd fight. It is a fight, and if they happens to know a white woman <clears throat> is going with a black man. She were taunted nigger lover and also beaten up. By the late 1950s, the rich promise of the mother country was turning sour. The immigrants' disillusionment was complete. It was a, an age of tremendous cruelty to black people. You know, tremendous cruelty. You know, it's now in reflection, 30 years later, you're looking at it and saying, my God, how did we survive? How did we survive all of these things? the racism, the pressure, you know, the odd hours. I mean, so I used to go on the, on the tube on the morning, and all you saw were rows of elderly black women going to work in the hospitals, going to clean, going to do the dirty jobs, you know, and nobody wanted. And after they'd gone, then uh, half an hour later, you see, the men going out to work on the building sites, to go and do, you know, this place, bomb sites, right, to go and rebuild it. The second industrial revolution in England was mainly worked out by, by the blacks and the Irish. We took these bomb sites in the cities and put these big bloody buildings which they have, they've got there right now. And what did we get? Probably get a kick up the ass when you got back home because somebody was throwing you out of your home. The ugly cocktail of bigotry, envy and sexual jealousy was bound to find a focus. It came in the streets of Nottingham in the summer of 1958. There was the term known by the teddy boy circle. When they're going out to attack black, they call it black burying. And uh, so that sort of problem was there. And um, people just feel enough is enough. West Indians in Nottingham reacted to the increasing violence against them by fighting back. In one notorious incident, a West Indian known as Roy led an impulsive act of defiance. Well, what happened, he was uh, at a party, and as soon as they heard that there was this disturbances at a pub nearby the Robin Hood Chase, they all decided, well, <laughs> we must get there. And he got in his car with a few others and went there, and there was this milling crowd, and he felt the best way, well, I better drive through this. <laughs> and he went through it at full tilt as quickly as he could. I think a policeman must get bounced on the backside or something like that. I remember when Roy was telling me, I said, but look, man, that was dangerous. He said, Eric, you're too damn nice a chap, man. It gives me satisfaction. At least we can fight back. You know, at least we can fight back and people will realize we're not prepared to sit and take this sort of thing anymore. They attacked my countrymen, then they have attacked me as well. And if they attack us, then it means that we're going to make certain that we get the last hit. If they do not attack us, they have no fear of us. But if they attack, then we'll fight back. And foremost, of course, is the long-term policy that ultimately will have to be adopted. And that is the development of the West Indies themselves, because that is the only answer to this particular problem. The West Indies, the travel brochures tell one, are gay, sunlit islands, a tourist's paradise. The West Indian who works in the sugar plantations for a few shillings a day thinks differently. True, his music is gay and his homeland sunny, but hundreds of his friends have no work and there is no dole. Many years ago, Lloyd George referred to the islands as the slums of the empire. The ramshackle, overcrowded houses tell why. In the markets, there is food for those who can afford it. For those who cannot, Britain seems to provide an answer. Eagerly, they borrow their £80 fare. 
The market in Brixton is, for them, a happier place than a market in the tourist's paradise they have left. Whitehall considered plans to treat members of the Commonwealth as aliens, just like all other nationalities. In other words, people from the Commonwealth would be stripped of their British citizenship. In fact, this question was being addressed by a secret civil service committee throughout the 1950s. It deliberately sought evidence that non-white immigrants had undesirable characteristics to help make the case for controls. Attention is drawn to the incidence of venereal disease among coloured people, which is slow mentally. And the speed of work in modern factories is quite They have a their disproportionately capacity. large number of convictions for brothel keeping and living on immoral earnings. The, the, the coloured people ought not to live in this district? Well, I, I wouldn't say the coloured people shouldn't live here, but I certainly say that there's a large element that should be taken out because uh, they're living on women and uh, one thing and the other. Is this special living on women, uh, women a specific thing in this district? Yes, it is rather bad around here. Why is that? I don't know, maybe it's the overcrowding. But I, my own personal opinion is this, that I happen to know plenty of white people who can't get a home, yet there's, these people continually come in the country, and even these children have got much to look forward to as far as getting married when they get a bit older, have they? They can't get homes, the people around the corner wait four years at home over the child. Uh, well, why don't the coloured people get homes and the white people can't? Well, from what I understand, they all club together and they simply buy a place up, just like that. Well, why can't the white people do that? Because the money's not there. Bramley, you run this pub in the street. Have you had any trouble from coloured people in the district? Not, not in the house itself, no, I will say that. The only thing is wrong around here is that the houses are... A lot of houses around here are run as brothels and that sort of thing, which is altogether wrong. Now, can you hear any noise from the houses here at night? Yes, there has been until half past four in the morning. Noise which has kept lots of... Lots of people away. And do you think that's at the root of the trouble? It's a lot to do with it.